Welcome to Building the Future. I'm your host, Kevin Horick. The radio and TV version of the show air in over 12 states. This includes both coasts and Silicon Valley. The show also airs in the UK, Caribbean, and Australia. For full show times, plus past episodes of the TV and radio show, please visit buildingthefutureshow.com. We just launched a free online community to connect past guests, listeners, and others. This community will allow you to network, chat on Slack, or get help with anything else, and a lot more. If you're interested in joining the community, buying some merch, sponsoring the show, or signing up for the newsletter, please go to buildingthefutureshow.com. I want to invite all of you in the Building the Future community to join me at SUPEX, the Startup Expo in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, this July 26th, where I'll be the MC. SUPEX is one of the largest and best startup conferences in the U.S. and the official gathering of the Building the Future community this summer. SUPEX has cutting-edge content, a cool startup competition, and a half-day forum this year called Hashtag Women for Women, the largest gathering in the U.S. in 2018 of angel groups, seed funds, and VC funds focused on female founders and female entrepreneurs. For more information, visit www.sup-x.org. I hope to see all my Building the Future friends there. Welcome back to the show. Today we have Jeffrey Bennett. He's an astronomer, teacher, and writer. Jeff, welcome to the show. Thanks very much for having me on. Yeah, I'm excited to have you on the show. Um, Well, I'm, I'm actually quite fascinated by a bunch of the stuff that you've done and are currently doing. Um, but maybe before we kind of get into all that fun stuff, let's get to know you a little bit better and start off with where you grew up. Well, I grew up primarily in San Diego, although uh, we moved around a bit um, okay. until I was seven years old and we landed there. But mostly in San Diego, I went to uh, Point Loma High School down there Okay. and uh, UC San Diego for college. Okay. What did you take uh, in college? In college, I was actually a biophysics major. Okay. What made you want to go into that, just out of curiosity? Well, I had always been interested in uh, science and space and okay. um I really liked physics in particular, and I liked biology too, so biophysics seemed like a good combo. And uh, But then I decided to switch gears over to astrophysics for grad school. Okay. And that was because uh, right as I was getting ready to go to grad school, I had, in fact, I'd already been accepted to go to grad school in biophysics, uh, Carl Sagan's original Cosmos series came on. And I also loved teaching already. Yeah, I loved teaching, and uh, I watched that, and I thought, wow, if I'm going to be teaching – astrophysics is going to be a lot more fun to teach with kids than biophysics so sure yeah that's fair. <laughs> um okay so you you get out of university walk me through kind of your career and maybe some career highlights up into kind of all the stuff you're doing now well so when i went into grad school because of, you know i was inspired by carl sagan i knew that i wanted to focus on the education side of things okay. so i actually uh, had a wonderful thesis advisor who was willing to indulge the fact that uh, I was doing enough research for my PhD, but planned to go on the education track after that. Okay. And uh, Tom Ayers, he was terrific in uh, helping me with that process. And uh, one of the things we did while I was there in grad school was we built this scale model of the solar system on okay. the University of Colorado campus. Very cool. Um, as a, a memorial to the Challenger astronauts. Sure. And uh, that, since that time, we've uh, rep- replicated that. The, the program's gone national. We have one on the National Mall in Washington, D.C., the Voyage Scale Model Solar System, which is out in front of the National Air and Space Museum. Wow. And my colleague who runs that program, Jeff Goldstein, is working to spread those all around the world. Um, we've got them in about a dozen, uh, either built or on, on the way in about a dozen cities now. Very cool. And they showed the solar system at uh, one ten billionth of actual size. So you get a real sense of how tiny the Earth is and how it fits into the scheme of things in space. Uh, But anyway, in terms of my career, that turned out to have a lot of influence because right as I was finishing my Ph.D. in astrophysics, the university was doing a uh, revamp of their core curriculum, including their math curriculum. And they were starting something called quantitative reasoning in math, which was for non-math and science majors, a way of thinking about, you know, kind of the the everyday things we do with math in our careers and our lives. 
And uh, because of my involvement in the model solar system, they knew that I was interested in teaching and education. So even though I was an astronomer, they invited me to join in in planning that curriculum. And uh, that ended up being my first job post-PhD was running the quantitative reasoning program at the University of Colorado. Very and that, cool. because there was, no, there was no material available for it at the time, I had to write my own. And that was what led me to become a textbook writer. Interesting. And, that's how my career took the path that it's taken. <laughs> sure. Well, and you've written a bunch of college or university textbooks. Is that correct? Yeah, I have, uh, I have six textbooks, and they're in four different subjects. So I have uh, the math book, that quantitative reasoning book. I have a statistical reasoning book. Okay. And then I have astrobiology, and then I have three different versions of my astronomy textbook. Okay. So when... When you say you've written all these books, like, are you kind of constantly updating kind of like the volumes every few years or, or how does that kind of work? Yes, it is. And, and I shouldn't say just me. It's, I have co-authors okay. on all of them. Okay. I couldn't do it without because they, they, know, they understand the material much better than I do. So I kind of function more as the lead writer and, the, you know, focusing on the education piece. And they really help with all the expertise as well as the writing. And, um, yeah, we're, we're constantly uh, working. I'm usually working on one or two books a year. So, for example, okay. wow. my main astronomy textbook, we're in the ninth edition that we're working on wow. right now. And the seventh edition of my quantitative reasoning book just came out um, a couple months ago in January. Okay. No, very cool. That, that's, that's interesting. I've always was kind of curious about um, that stuff because, obviously, like, you go through – kind of textbooks throughout your, you know, educational career and the, the numbers get quite high, but it seems like a lot of work to keep those updated. And, and like, it seems to me anyway, not that space hasn't been kind of cool for, for decades, but it seems to be tre trendy might be the wrong word for it, but it seems to be a lot more popular and kind of more mainstream than it ever has been. Is, is that kind of fair to say, or is that kind of a naive statement? Well, I think that's fair to say. Uh, you know, I think the science has really expanded. People have been very excited about space for a long time. With sure. The space program, Apollo, and so on. But, you know, things like the Hubble Space Telescope and the missions to sure. Mars and Saturn, the Cassini mission to Saturn and New Horizons to Pluto, have really, I think, awakened the public about more than just having people in space, which is really, really cool, sure. um, but also that we're doing this incredible science and learning about our place in the universe. And, and from the standpoint of a textbook writer, we're discovering things at such an incredibly fast rate that uh, the textbooks are out of date pretty darn quick, which is why we have to keep uh, rewriting them and, and updating them. Sure. Well, and it seems to me anyway that a lot of more mainstream kind of um, websites and, and papers and stuff are, are covering it a lot more. Have you noticed that as well? Yes, definitely. There's huge, huge interest in, in this. I mean, you know, this is getting at the most fundamental questions that we can ask as sure. human beings. Well, who are we? What is our place in the universe? And we're actually getting some real answers to those questions today. So that's something that excites people. Sure. Um, so I, I, before we kind of get into uh, the global warming stuff, you have done a huge amount of stuff kind of in the educational space for kids with your uh, BigKidsScience.com. Uh, what exactly is that and how did that kind of come to be? Well, so back uh, going way back to my undergraduate years, I'd had an interest in teaching and I actually took a year off between my freshman and sophomore years okay. when I at teaching in a second and third grade classroom. And then I kept working in that classroom the rest of my undergraduate career. I ran my own summer school for elementary and middle school kids for a few years. And so I'd had this long interest in trying to write material for kids. Um, okay. As we talked about, I, I, I kind of by accident, I ended up be, uh, becoming a college textbook writer. And once uh, that started to pick up and I started to have some success with that. I was talking to some of my friends at the uh, publishing company that I was working with. Uh, it was Addison Wesley at the time. Now it's Pearson. And talked to them about my interest in writing for children, and they were very interested in that too. So we just sort of on our own started Big Kid Science as, uh, as our way of publishing these books that I'd wanted to write for kids for a long time. 
Um, so that was the origin of Big Kid Science, was to write science, accurate science books for kids that would not only be accurate, uh, which unfortunately a lot of kids' books in science are not, but also that would have a story to them. So they wouldn't just appeal to kids who were already interested in science, but they'd also appeal to uh, kids who were looking for a story. And that was where the idea of uh, having my dog go into space came from was to write stories around that that would teach the science at the same time sure no that's very cool like and you've written a ton of kids books and you even had one kind of read from by like an astronaut in in space from the international space station is that correct well actually i've, I've written six kids books and all six of okay, them all six. are up a station and have been read by the astronauts that's amazing so how did that come to yeah be? that was <laughs> So the way I the way I'm told the story, the, the, it was uh, this program called Storytime from Space was okay. started by a woman named Patricia Tribe, who used to be the head of education down at the Johnson Space Center in Houston, and an astronaut named Alvin Drew, who will be familiar to a lot of people because he was the featured um, astronaut in a long running Air Force commercial called uh, I Am an American Airman. Okay, and interesting. Alvin and Patricia came up with this idea of reading books from from space, having the astronauts read books from space. And because Alvin is an astronaut, he was going on a mission where he could actually do it. And apparently they somehow were familiar with my books. And I got a phone call one day saying, uh, do you mind if we read your book from space? <laughs> um, That's awesome. And, and what? Once they convinced me that it wasn't a prank phone call, <laughs> it wasn't very <laughs> difficult to read that, right? And so he, Alvin uh, actually read uh, Max Goes to the Moon from the uh, Space Shuttle Discovery on its final voyage in 2011. Okay. And he read from a PDF on his computer screen because he didn't have permission at that time to take the physical book up because that's weight. Oh, but after he did that, uh, NASA got so excited about the idea that working with uh, the group who runs the space station, it's a group called CASIS down in Florida, they basically operate the NASA side of the space station. Okay. Um, they arranged to make it possible with Patricia and Alvin to launch physical books to the space station. And the first five they set up and sent up in 2014 were, were my five kids' books at the time. And then I wrote another one, and they sent that up as part of a second batch of books that included books by some other authors, uh, some who were probably familiar to uh, a lot of the listeners, Rosie Revere Engineer by... Andrea Beatty has been read up there. Okay. Uh, LeVar Burton's book has been read up there. Mark Kelly's two books were actually read by his brother um, while he was up there on the space station from space. So uh, the program's been doing great. I hope everybody will check it out. You just go to space, uh, storytimefromspace.com. And that's how my books ended up on the space station. Sure. So you also wrote uh, like a Max Goes to Mars, Max Goes to Jupiter, Max goes to the space station, and then uh, the wizard who saved the world, and then I humanity. So, obviously, like you just kind of, I, th I think the Max kind of goes to the different kind of planets or the space station. Or, but what types of stuff do you kind of cover with your dog going to these different planets or the space station? Well, so interestingly enough, I I, I sort of write these books almost uh, what you might say backwards. I start okay. out with a science concepts that I want to teach. Okay. And once I have my list of science concepts related to the destination or whatever, um, then I write a story that will get those across. So, for example, when Max goes to the space station, we're talking about the science done on the space station, but we're also talking about what is weightlessness and why does it happen? You know, there's a common misconception that there's no gravity in space, but okay. of course, if there was no gravity, uh, the moon wouldn't be held in orbit, and neither would the space station. So there's obviously plenty of gravity in space. So then why are you weightless? And so we explain that in the book, um, explain why the space station was built, how it works, what kind of science is done from it, and so on. And similar for the other books, Max Goes to the Moon. I'm teaching a lot of concepts about the moon, what we might do on the moon, why I think it would be worth going there and building a university of the moon. Um, Max goes to Mars. We're talking about the search for life on Mars. Max goes to Jupiter. I talk a lot about Jupiter itself and about its moons, and in particular, the possibility of life on its moon Europa, which is uh, what's featured on the cover of that particular book. Sure. And then what about The Wizard Who Saved the World and I, Humanity? 
So The Wizard Who Saved the World is the book I wrote to uh, try to be a kid's book on global warming. Okay. With the idea of trying to be, you know, it's, it's, it can be difficult to teach kids about global warming without scaring them, right? Sure. And we want to do that. We want to inspire kids and make them see this not as something that's a threat to them, but more as an opportunity to them because they are the ones who will get to solve it and create the better world that we're going to get out of solving it. So the wizard who saved the world that you can kind of see in the title, that theme running through it, that it's about a little boy who dreams of being a wizard who can magically solve problems like global warming and then figures out that in fact, he doesn't have to be a wizard. He can do all kinds of real jobs that will help make the world a better place and solve these problems. And at the end of the book, he realizes that because of that, in a sense, he's become a wizard after all. Interesting. Uh, and then your, your so I yeah. Humanity book? And I Humanity, uh, that's my, my most recent one. And that kind of grew out of a trip we took to Africa um, okay. just a few years ago. I did a bunch of school visits in Ethiopia. And I met with uh, all different ages of kids. But one of the things that, that kind of surprised me was I met with a bunch of high school kids there. And these were really good high school kids at an excellent school. They, they knew calculus. They knew physics. They wow. knew chemistry. They had all those things down pat. But they had never heard of the International Space Station. They didn't know that people had been to the moon. They'd never heard of the Hubble Space Telescope. So I, I wanted to write a book that would – teach kids around the world about the amazing things that we've been able to do and how we've learned about our place in the universe. But I wanted to do it in a way that would not just say, this is what other people did. Sure. So my idea is uh, in I humanity is that it's called, it starts with the word I, because it's told from the point of view of a narrator who represents the entire human race. So it starts out when I was a child thousands of years ago. Right. Okay. I used to think the earth was flat. And sure. then it takes through how an imaginary person representing all of us through time learns what we know today about the universe. And my hope, and, I, and I've had some good feedback that it's successful, was that by doing it this way, even no matter where you live, no matter what culture you're from, you can feel like this is you as a human being making these discoveries and learning these things about our world because that's the way it really is it, it's not the individual or the culture that did it it's the human race that's sure. done these things and in fact uh, one of the things that really inspired me to write that book was story time from space because once i knew my books could be read from the international space station and they told me that this book would be read if i wrote it um i knew that even though i have no way to actually get the physical books to to places like Africa because it's too expensive to ship them. Interesting. Um, they can watch the video and for free just with the web link. Sure. And so this, that, that meant that I could write this book and have it reach audiences around the world that otherwise I wouldn't be able to reach. And so Story from Times and Space is, is really wonderful with that because it makes these things available globally for free. That's, a, that's amazing. So I, I think that's also kind of a good transition into you guys – with Big Kid Science, do you have a, kind of some pretty interesting, kind of innovative uh, school programs? Do you kind of want to talk about those? Well, we have a, a couple of things. You know, one is we have some activities and resources that are posted up on the website that, you know, people can just access at any time. And uh, that's probably the most useful to most people, to the largest number of people. I also do a lot of school visits myself, um, mainly because I love doing them. So I, sure. I'll go to elementary schools and, and do 45-minute assemblies based around uh, the kids' books that I've written. Very cool. And, and I have a blast with those, so I enjoy doing those, and the kids seem to enjoy them. So they, that's a lot of fun. And then I have programs I do for, for teachers, and uh, I've, I've done a lot of teacher workshops around teaching science and around using story time from space, those types of things. Sure. And, and then you want to talk about the Planetarium Show? Because I think that's pretty cool. And you, and you can stream it online? Yeah. So uh, they uh, the Fisk Planetarium here in Boulder decided to make a planetarium show out of my book, Max Goes to the Moon. Okay. And the timing 
turned out coincidentally be terrific because it was right when Alvin and Patricia had started the story time from space program. And so we were able to get astronaut Alvin Drew to come and be part of the, sh- the movie. So he's featured in the movie as well. Very cool. And uh, given that, you know, planetarium shows, it's available for free to any planetarium that wants it. If somebody wants to show it, uh, we can get them the files from this planetarium. But we also made it in a way that would work fine to stream flat screen online. And so it's a 34 minute uh, movie that you can find online. And we get lots of teachers streaming it into their classroom to, uh, so their kids can watch that. And it basically, it's kind of my school program in a movie form where I go through what I call an interactive reading. So you read, we read the whole book but also talk about a lot of the science concepts that are in it as we go along. Okay, very cool. Um, and then you also did an app. At, is that fair to say? What was, the, like, what was that behind that? So the app is called Totality, Totality by Big Kids Science. And in fact, I hope everyone will go download it right now because we just updated it, including a Spanish version. So very if you cool. have your phone language set to Spanish, You will now get it in Spanish. And I actually did this for the Eclipse last year. Um, I was looking for an app that would, there's a few great websites that helped people plan out, you know, what they could see during the uh, Eclipse last August, but there wasn't any great app for it. And I was, so I thought somebody must be doing that. And I contacted all the people who write Eclipse code and that have these websites. Uh, and one guy wrote back to me, it's a, a Frenchman named uh, Xavier Hubier. He's got probably the best interactive maps for eclipses. And uh, he said he didn't have time to create the app, but I said, well, how about if, if I fund it and you provide the code? And he said, deal. Very cool. So I found an app developer up in Portland, Germinate, LCC, LLC. And uh, so they created the app using his underlying code, and I helped him with designing the interface and the educational content. And so when you open up the app, it gives you maps for upcoming eclipses. So the reason we just updated this because last year's is obviously past. Sure. But there are other total, total eclipses coming up. There's uh, coming up in 2019 and 2020 down in Chile and Argentina, which is why we want to do the Spanish version. 2024 is the next big one in the United States. Interesting. And we also have lots of educational materials uh, that go along with eclipses. And you don't need to be in an eclipse to use them. They, they can be used at any time uh, in classrooms. And the app is completely free. There's no ads, no nothing. So I hope everybody will download it and start planning for future eclipses and learning about them. No, I, I think that's really great. And if people go to bigkidscience.com, you have tons of other kind of resources and things for the classroom and online and a bunch of free stuff. Um, but, I, but I really kind of want to switch gears a little bit and, and start covering kind of your, your book, kind of Global Warming Primer. Um, obviously, I think the title kind of gives it away a little bit what you're talking about. But maybe do you want to kind of give a quick overview of why did you write the book and kind of what is the book really about? Obviously, it's about global warming, but it's a huge kind of topic. Yeah, well, so um, I've been teaching about global warming for a very long time because it's something that we teach in our astronomy class. So I actually started teaching about global warming in the early 1980s. Wow. And, you know, my, um, my main job from all these books that I write is trying to make science Um, understandable to the public. And one of the things I really try to focus on is, is not losing sight of the big picture, right? Don't miss the forest for the trees. And I think a big problem having science education, both in the schools and in the public and the media is we get hung up on details and people never talk about the big picture. And global warming is in many ways, one of the, uh, you know, best, or worse, depending on your perspective, uh, examples of this. If you listen to people talk about global warming in the media, they're always talking about, well, what about this measurement? Or what about that model? Or what about that data? But nobody ever tells you, wait, where did this idea come from in the first place? Okay. And so we miss the big picture. And the big picture is the way I've been teaching it since the 1980s. So I wanted to, uh, I started actually doing a series of talks on global warming uh, to try to get that big picture across. 
And uh, once I started doing the talks, I realized, you know, when you go do a talk, you've got an hour, basically, you know, a little bit of time for Q&A. And there were a lot more questions coming up than I had time to answer in that hour. And so I decided I would write a book to back up the talk. So it's a global warming primer. um, And it's basically a a Q&A format in the book to discuss uh, the science, the consequences and the solutions to global warming. And so... My, my goal there was to answer all the common questions that people have after first giving them the big picture overview of global warming. And I should point out the, uh, the whole book is actually posted for free online at globalwarmingprimer.com because I want to make it as accessible as possible. If you buy the book, that makes me happy. I love it. Sure. Um, but if you don't want to buy the book and just want to learn the material, you can still do that without having to pay anything. Sure. So, I, I guess kind of obviously like we want people to go read the book, but what is kind of the, the misconceptions that, you know, we've kind of been maybe told or, or subject to that? Because I, I don't necessarily want to get kind of political, but I think at the end of the day, it, it is kind of a political thing because there's a lot of people, you know, naysayers. There's a lot of people that believe it and kind of everywhere in between. There's probably some people that don't care. Um, but But what do you kind of, address that we've kind of been misled on i guess is the maybe not maybe not the best way to put it but you know what i mean yeah well i think there, there's there's a bunch of things but the, maybe in some ways the two biggest ones are number one that there's some difficulty or complexity to this science there's okay. not and i'll come back to that in a moment and number two that there's some political component to it there's not that either and in fact one of the things i really emphasize in the book and in my talks is that the first major global leader to say, hey, this is real and it's a major problem, was actually Margaret Thatcher. Interesting. In 1989, she gave a speech to the United Nations talking about how serious and real this problem was and how we needed to deal with it. Um, And she's one of the founding icons of modern conservatism. So when you see that, that she and Al Gore were saying exactly the same things, you realize it can't be political if two people from such completely opposite sides of the spectrum are saying exactly the same things. So the idea that it's even political is kind of a myth that's been given to us uh, okay. through, the, through the media debate over the years. So I try to get away from that. But to get to that basic science, um, I call it global warming one, two, three. And it's because it is really that simple. The number one is that we've known for 150 years that greenhouse gases like carbon dioxide make planets warmer than they would be otherwise. Sure. In fact, I mentioned before that it's an acid topic we teach in astronomy. It's because that's why Venus is so hot. And we teach about this in astronomy. Why is Venus so hot? Because greenhouse gases make planets warmer. There is no scientific dispute on this issue at all. Okay. Um, number two is we are adding more carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases to the atmosphere. So we have data showing that very, very clearly. It's been measured directly since the 1950s, and we have ice core data that shows the rise since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. And there's no question about this either. Okay. And so if you know, number one, that more greenhouse gases make planets warmer, and number two, that we're putting more in the atmosphere, Number three is pretty obvious. It's going to get warmer. Sure. And again, what people don't hear in the media is that this is accepted by all scientists. Gotcha. Even the ones who you hear about as being skeptics, they're not mm-hmm. skeptics of that. They're skeptics of how bad it's going to be. I see. But they agree that global warming is going to happen based on what we've been doing. It's only a question of how bad it's going to be and how quickly it's going to happen. Okay. And that's the part that most people don't realize, that we're not having an argument scientifically about whether it's real and human caused. We're having an argument about how bad it will be. It's sure. just a risk assessment. I see. Well, the other thing, too, is, like, we're clearly polluting the planet. So does it even really, like, to me, it's just a simple issue is we shouldn't be tr- polluting the planet that we live on right like I, I get that's kind of really fundamental and pretty basic statement but and it's way more complicated than that but 
like we're clearly doing it right like if you just google around or watch a documentary like we've polluted the oceans we're polluting the planet we're doing all this stuff like why wouldn't we want to try to reverse some of that and and make it better right like is that kind of fair to say and like how do you argue with that right well i i think that's true and in fact you know one of the difficulties with global warming is that it's a form of pollution that you don't see easily you only notice mm, it in its sure. fine effects over time um, and, and kind of in an ironic sense, one of the reasons why I'm very optimistic that we're going to get action on global warming is because when you, it, the same things that solve global warming will also solve these other kinds of more visible pollution problems. You know, you see the air around the world, particularly sure. in places like China and India, mm-hmm. uh, people there are up in arms about the fact that they don't really have breathable air anymore. Sure. And that's forcing their governments to say, hey, we're, we need to do something about this. And it's the same. The, the solutions to the air pollution problems are this, and to a lot of the water pollution problems are the same as the solutions to global warming, which is to wean yourself away from fossil fuels. Sure. And, you know, there's other things we do to the ocean that, that we should avoid doing as well. But you're right. I think when people see these things visibly, we realize we we should change that. And again, to get back to the non-political aspects in the book, I have a wonderful quote from uh, Ronald Reagan about okay. the definition of a conservative being someone who wants to take care of the environment and leave the environment to our descendants in as good or better shape than it was given to us. Interesting. So what other kind of things do you cover in the book or other kind of questions do you answer in the book that I think maybe a lot of people are have kind of been you know given the wrong information in the past well so the the first chapter i basically go through that one two three science okay. like we just talked about in the second chapter i now go to the the common skeptic arguments that you hear in the media and sure. again these are about risk. they're not about whether they're about um they're not about whether it's going to happen they're about how bad is it going to be and i explain why these Skeptics, you know, you can't say they're absolutely wrong. They're smart people. They're scientists. Sure. You know, but they have not been able to convince most of their colleagues. That's where you hear about this scientific consensus that the vast majority of people who studied this believe it's a serious and immediate problem, including me. Um, That's why I explain why we think that. And even though, you know, we can't completely rule out that these other folks are, are incorrect in thinking it won't be that bad. We just think it's not worth the risk of uh, that that's involved. And then I explain what those risks are. The consequences is the next chapter of the book. And, you know, there's, there's a lot of consequences. People hear global warming and they think, well, it's just going to get warmer. But, of course, there's way more to it than that. In particular, you're trapping more energy in Earth's system and energy is what drives weather, and that's why we're seeing more extreme weather events, why we see more big floods, more droughts, more severe hurricanes and things like that taking place. A uh, rise in sea level, which uh, you know is going to affect a lot of people around the world because so many people live close to the coast where a rise in sea level is going to affect them. And, uh, and then at the end of the book, I talk about the solutions, and I think that's the part that I would say is also really uh, misunderstood. People think the solutions are difficult. Okay. Um, and, you know, in a sense, they are. It is difficult to change your energy economy from one that uses fossil fuels to one that uses other sources, whether those are renewables, nuclear. Um, there are things we can replace our fossil fuels with without having any less energy than we have today. But the part that I think people miss is that when you look at the cost of that, we usually think, well, gosh, that's going to be expensive. But in fact, we're actually subsidizing the use of fossil fuels in a lot of ways that people uh, don't pay close attention to. There's the obvious subsidies like tax subsidies to oil and coal companies. But there's also less obvious ones like the costs of the health costs of air pollution and water pollution. And the cost of the military cost of protecting the oil supply and maybe even far bigger the fact that groups like ISIS 
and Al Qaeda and and Iran and Russia, most of their money that they use to do things around the world that we don't like has come from us buying fossil fuels from them. Interesting. So we've actually been funding our enemies through these things. And when you factor in all those costs, you find that actually if we switched over to renewables and nuclear or some combination thereof, we'd be getting just as much energy as we are today for less total money. Interesting. So it would actually improve the economy. And, uh, and you've seen this. There, there was a group of uh, Republican leaders uh, from past administrations. George Schultz is one of the leaders of this movement who called this the conservative answer to climate change, which is the fact that if we tax carbon, tax the fuel, fossil fuels that lead to global warming, will actually make the economy stronger because we'll now be getting the same energy for less money. Interesting. So, uh, like, I'm curious, though, is there something that the average person could kind of do on like a daily, weekly or monthly basis to that maybe doesn't impact their life in, in a lot of ways? Because I, I think part of the challenges is either people don't care, they don't think about it, or they think that, you know, they have to change their whole whole life to do you know, good. And I, and it pains me to kind of say this. I think most people just d- won't make the effort, right? But is there right. things that, you know, people could just maybe be more mindful of or think about maybe on a daily, monthly, or weekly kind of basis that could make a huge impact? Well, you know, obviously, on, on a global scale, the, as individuals, the less energy we use that contributes to global warming, sure. the better. But um, I, I actually believe you can do this without having to make sacrifices for the reasons I just explained, which is that if we were to switch to alternative energy sources, you could have your lifestyle just as it is today okay. for less money. And so global warming is a global problem, and therefore it needs global solutions led by nations. Okay. And the way you do that is by convincing your politicians that we need to take action on this. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the simple, to me, the simple answer is you impose a carbon tax. Okay. Uh, and there's various ways to do that. Uh, the conservative answer to climate change, people propose this, ta- uh, what they call tax and dividend, where they don't want the government to have more money. So every month they send dividend checks out to everybody in the United States with whatever tax has been collected. And that actually helps it so that people who are, poorer and might not be able to afford that tax, they're actually going to get more back in the dividend checks than they spent on the tax in the first place. And what that does is it creates a market incentive to move away from fossil fuels. And uh, my personal belief is if we did that, we would move away from fossil fuels quite quickly because they're actually more expensive for the energy than the alternative. And in the process, we would develop new technologies for these renewables and nuclear that the rest of the world would then want to buy because they'd be cheaper than the fossil fuels that they're using today. So, you know, I think it's, it's a very easily solvable problem. And I think the number one action I would recommend to everyone is vote for people who commit to solving this problem. Okay. So obviously like this is going to take, you know, years, maybe half a decade, a decade potentially just because of just, Moving, changing government and nations is not easy, right? Uh, you know, right. Um, I, I usually, when I've done my talks, I've often asked my audience, how long do you think this would take? Just because I was curious as sure. a, from a poll member. And most people would say, you know, 10 to 30 year time scale. And I did this talk at a, at a retirement home, my parents' retirement home, actually, okay. a, a year or so ago. And this guy in his 90s, when I asked that question, said three years. Okay. I was like, really? Only three years? Nobody's ever given me a time scale like that before. And he said, look, I lived through World War II. We completely changed the entire United States economy in less than three years because we needed to to win that war. Interesting. And uh, when you sit back on that, you realize, yeah, it's only a matter of how much we care. 
If okay. we said this is so important that we are going to solve it now and make the transition in three years, there's nothing stopping us from do it, doing it. We have all the technology that we need. Um, you know, again, like nuclear power plants, for example, a lot of people have various issues with nuclear power, but it doesn't produce any greenhouse gases. Okay. And we do know how to build them safer than we did in the past. So those are something you could replace existing power plants with quite easy. Renewables, we have to scale them up a lot, but there is plenty of renewable energy coming into the, into the world system. Uh, you know, we only have to tap there's 20,000 times as much solar energy reaching the earth every day as we would need to power the entire world economy. So if we could just build enough solar panels and batteries to store the energy to tap one twenty thousandth of the incoming solar energy, that alone would solve the problem without nuclear, without wind or anything else. So we have so many ways that we could solve the problem right now if we decided it was important enough. Okay. Interesting. So... But I, I'm curious, though, like this renewable space, is there anything that some of the listeners could maybe think about maybe starting a business in that is maybe a, a, a needed area that maybe not a lot of people are, are kind of playing with? Because there, there is, and I've had a bunch of people on the show that are, are doing kind of renewable energy kind of startups from solar to wind to, to a bunch of different things. But is there anything that you could see that there's maybe kind of a lacking of or needs more competition in? Or, or is it kind of just whatever renewable energy that they could maybe, you know, start a company in? Well, I would say there's all kinds of opportunities there because there is a need for more competition, more ideas. Um, and, and by the way, I'll just point people to a group called Environmental Entrepreneurs, or okay. E2.org, um, which I'm a member of. And there, that's a group of lots of people who have started environmentally oriented companies. And so you can get lots of ideas and networking from, from that group. E2.org is their website, the letter E and the number two. And um, yeah, I, I think when you realize that we've got 7 billion people on this planet who want more energy, and uh, we want to provide it to them through new forms of energy that don't release greenhouse gases, uh, you can't get a better economic business opportunity than that. And so if you've got a good idea on how to make something happen in that space, um, you should be going for it because that's where the future lies. And uh, our economy is going to go with gangbusters on those kinds of things. Sure. And, and the other thing that I'm curious about to get your thoughts on is – it seems to me anyway, and I just had the internet um, upgraded at my house to a faster speed, and I was talking to the installer, and he said that they're basically trying to support 60 devices in a household nowadays for a family of kind of four. And I that kind of struck me as a, like a ton. But then he said, well, as we get into kind of more smart home things where um, you know, more and more of your appliances are connected, you know, you're, you're going to potentially need that many. So, and, and I know some of them or a lot of them argue that they don't use a lot of energy, but are, do you find that as kind of a society now, maybe North America and other parts of the world that are getting more connected, are we using more energy than we ever have or has kind of the fact that we're using kind of more eco-friendly some people i should say you know light bulbs and appliances and, and things like that are we are we using more or less is it about the same or or do you do you know anything related to that kind of stat wise yeah we're actually energy use per capita has actually been dropping because of that efficient efficiency okay. and in fact when i talk about the technology that we need to solve global warming as well as all these other pollution issues. There's basically three tech, three groups of technologies. I've mentioned the renewable and nuclear already. The third is efficiency technologies, because okay. when you become more efficient, you need less energy in the first place. Right. And we're doing incredible things with, with efficiency technologies. You know, most people are pretty well aware these days that replacing your light bulbs with LED bulbs reduces your energy use to about a quarter of what it was. Sure. Um, what you may not realize is that those are still wasting about 80% of the heat 
uh, wow. electricity going for them. And people are working on even better light bulb technologies for the future that will, will do even more. Uh, more efficient appliances, more efficient air condition conditioners. Um, there's so many things going on in the efficiency space as well. So that's another great opportunity for entrepreneurs is to uh, work on new efficiency technologies. And then you look at, you know, there's just incredible ideas. You know, you look at the things Elon Musk is doing. Um, the solar roof, for example, that yep. uh, he's, he's putting in. Now your entire roof can be solar panels, not just the space where those rectangles happen to fit. Um, there, there's really amazing things going on and great, great opportunities for, for even more to be done. Sure. Well, and I miss, like, just for that Elon Musk roof thing, like, they don't, it doesn't look like a solar panel roof. Like, it, 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 it's not those, like, panels. Like, the actual roofing tiles are the solar panels. That's how I understand it. Is it correct? In the pictures I've seen, yeah, in the pictures I've seen, it looks exactly like a regular roof. I'm, sure. It's kind of amazing. I haven't seen it in person yet, sure. but uh, the photos, it looks like just a normal roof, and yet it's collecting solar energy over the whole thing. Because I, I think, like, that's where, to me, the real innovation happens, right? Because, sure, there's some people that have no problem putting solar panels on their roof or their business, and... In, in my opinion, it, it shouldn't matter. But there's still, there's people out there that really care about the look of things, right? And if you can kind of hide, um, you know, green technology inside of something that looks like something they would genuinely buy that doesn't kind of distract from, you know, the look and feel of their house or their business or you know, kind of their their brand, I think people are a lot more easy to adapt that. And I think, like, I think even another really good example is kind of like Tesla, right? Like, yes, they're building electric cars, but they're not the first per people to do it. They just made, like, a really nice electric car, yep. and they're coming out with kind of a more affordable um, electric car right away. Um, whereas, you know, the traditional... What people, they they weren't that nice looking. I, I think like I I know that EV one I think uh, that was yeah. piloted in California what like a decade or so ago. Yeah, quite people a love while those ago. cars, yeah. right? And there was a whole documentary around that. And people love those cars, and they tried to yeah. buy them, and the program got shut down for I don't know a handful of reasons. That go watch the documentary. It kind of talks about it, um, but I, I think. Tesla was kind of the first to make it kind of cool and, and trendy and other companies have kind of followed that. I saw an ad the other day. I, I wish I remember, was it Toyota or something that basically you, it was an electric car, but then if you ran out of kind of battery, it would start using gas. Um, oh, they have the plug in, the plug in Prius prime. Yep. Was, was that it Prius that I thought it was an SUV, but I, I could be wrong. Well, they may have an SUV also, but I know the Prius Prime is a plug-in hybrid like that, and there's more of those coming out. Yeah, so uh, like, because cause that was one of the big things that I was reading kind of early on was, it, it's like your phone, right? Like, you're worried that if you're out for the night, if you're going to have enough battery for your phone, and, and I get that if you're on a long road trip, that you're, you're worried that you're not going to be able to charge your car, right? And I, I know they're working on fixing that and building kind of charging stations throughout kind of North America and, and kind of other countries. But that's a real issue, right, for people. And being able to kind of have something to fall back on, I think a lot of people don't think about, but they would potentially buy a car if knowing that there was solutions to that or at least that problem was kind of gone. Is that fair to say? Yeah, I think it is. Um, I would say that the electric charging problem is it's not gone yet but um tesla is making big progress on it because they have put these they have a network along all the major freeways now sure. where you can always find a charging station before you run out of a, a charge so it's no longer really any different than the risk of running out of gas sure um, but yes i think one of the things that that elon musk's done an incredible job with is realizing that that people want stuff to still be cool yeah. and help at the same time. And it kind of goes back to what I said before, you know, I, I think 
it's great when people want to do things like, you know, hang their clothes instead of use a dryer. Sure. But most people aren't willing to make that kind of change because it takes a lot more effort. Yeah, or they and live in a the place where they can't, is, right? Like if you if you have winter, you right? You can't put your clothes outside to dry right. if it's freezing out. <laughs> so fair. Exactly. And and the reality is that once you factor in the true costs of fossil fuels, as I said before, it's actually cheaper to use the alternatives than it is to use the fossil fuels. And that means we can all have the same lifestyles we have today. In fact, better lifestyles for less money if we just push our politicians to uh, make a real level free market. The reason we don't have that today is because we subsidize the fossil fuels so heavily. But sure. if we put on a carbon tax, then we would have a true free market. And in a true free market, fossil fuels are going to lose. Interesting. And then what, what are your thoughts on, and you kind of alluded it to earlier in the conversation about actually building technology, renewable technology, that basically um, you can plug into current infrastructure. Is, is how big of a reality is that? Like, is that really a thing that, you know, people could do? I, I've seen, like I had a guy on the show, I don't know, a year or so ago that they were basically building pellets that you could put into coal mines that were renewable, um, that didn't pollute way, like barely any compared to obviously like coal, right? But like how, uh -huh. how likely is that, you know, to use current infrastructure or do we need to build kind of all new infrastructure or heavily modify current infrastructure? You know, I think we can do a lot with the current infrastructure. The infrastructure okay. that we're talking about really is mainly the grid, right? Yeah. And electrical grid. And so nuclear power plants, which I was mentioning before, yeah. um, aside from location issues, they can plug into the grid very easily because they are producing a steady source of power just like fossil fuels do. Okay. The, the difficulty we face with solar and with wind is that they're intermittent sources. Right. But there's a simple solution to that, which is basically storage, batteries. Okay. So that's why Elon Musk and Tesla is building batteries like crazy yeah. to try to solve that problem. And there's all kinds of other interesting ideas. For example, uh, one that I read about recently, which I thought was amazing, was to use coal mines as um, storage for energy from solar and wind. And the way you do that is coal mines turned out to turn out to be really good at, you could fill them up with water and uh, let the water drain down, use the gravity of that as a storage oh, interesting. mechanism. So you pump the water up with your solar or your wind when they're operating, and then you get the energy out of it as gravity drops it back down. And so you could actually use coal mines as a renewable source of energy in that way. Interesting. Um, and so there are all kinds of brilliant ideas that could actually bring jobs to the same places where people are worried about losing them and bring them without the risk of black lung disease and all these other problems that go along with the current mining structure. Interesting. Yeah. And, and I guess you, you kind of alluded it to it earlier about like, the nuclear power plant kind of option. I, I know like people were freaking out a while ago about kind of what was happening in Japan. Like how much of a real kind of issue is kind of having a nuclear power plant from like a safety issue? Well, the existing, most of the existing power plants that we have today yeah. have some real safety concerns associated okay. with them. And, that, and we've seen these accidents before, but there are, better ways of building nuclear plant power plants that don't have those issues if we do it correctly. For example, the main risk with existing nuclear power plants is, is what you call a meltdown, right? Sure. Where the reaction runs out of control. And that can happen because if your cooling system fails, you get a meltdown. Right. But there are other ways of building nuclear power plants where if the cooling system fails, it automatically turns itself up. Those are what's called passive cooling technologies rather than active cooling technologies. And uh, for example, Bill Gates uh, is a big investor in some of these new nuclear technologies to build them in ways that are safer, where you don't have the waste because you can reprocess the fuel until it becomes such low grade radioactive material that it's really no longer even dangerous, as opposed to the current situation where we have dangerous high level nuclear waste. So we would have to do it differently than we've done it in the past, but okay. but I do believe that those technologies are out there. Interesting. 
Okay. No, that that's that's always something that's kind of fascinating to me because I think just based on like historical events and and maybe even something like the the Simpsons or, and other kind of like pop culture things, it's made out to be like the world's going to come to an end if it gets out, right? Like if one of those things actually melts right. down. And 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 I I've just kind of selfishly maybe fascinated about, you know, that. So I thought I would kind of um, mention that, but, but Jeff, we're, we're at the end of the show. So maybe let's close with mentioning where people can get more information about yourself, the books, the stuff for classrooms and students, the app and, uh, you know, global warming primer. Yeah. Well, probably the best way to start is at big because if you go there to my books page, you have links to everything else, including the global warming primer. But I'll say the other main websites besides BigKidsScience.com, uh, GlobalWarmingPrimer.com is the one that I have specifically focused on global warming. StoryTimeFromSpace.com is where you can see the astronauts reading the books from orbit, including my six books, as well as books by a number of other authors. And I also have a personal website, JeffreyBennett.com. Perfect, Jeff. Well, I really appreciate you taking the time out of your day to be on the show, and I look forward to keeping in touch with you and have a good rest of your day. Thank you so much. I really appreciate being on, and uh, I love your show and uh, wish you continued success. Thanks very much, man. All right, you have a good rest of your day. We'll talk soon. Thanks. Bye. Take care. Bye. Thanks for listening. To join the free community, buy some merch, sponsor the show, or sign up for the newsletter, please visit the website at buildingthefutureshow.com. The music for the show is done by Electric Mantra. You can check them out at electricmantra.com and keep building the future.